Okay, so good morning, everyone. Again, uh, I'm Jesse Hempel or Tlali Logula from the Guasanacoro Nations here in Stanamo Territory. And I'm excited to have up to an hour with you to talk about capturing engagement effectively. Um, and what we mean by that is um, tracking your community engagement so that you can bring those notes, that information back and weave it into the uh, drafting for the conference of community plan or other reports, just making sure you're tracking engagement effectively. Um, good morning, Catherine. It's so nice to see your face. Uh, and I see Pearl is here as well and other folks. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, before I get into my slides, I am wondering if folks have specific questions about capturing engagement effectively that you want to share with me so I can make sure that when I get to those slides, I'm speaking directly to the things that you want to know. And so um, either using the Zoom chat or just like unmuting yourself right now to share your question verbally, what are you wondering when it comes to how to capture community engagement effectively? Catherine, I can see that you've got one. Are you unmuting yourself? I'd love to hear your voice. Hey, Jesse. Hey. Um, yeah, there, there's a piece about um, the visualness of it and how, how to like how to capture it and have participants be able to maybe validate it almost not at the same time, but as we go along, so that there it just makes the back and forth quicker. And there's also the piece about capturing it in a way that fits with what the participants are saying. So like different kinds of capturing the engagement. So those are like my ways of thinking right now. <laughs> Love it. Okay, I can definitely speak to those things. And we'll also invite you and others to share your own techniques that have worked well for you. Um, great. Anybody else with a specific like question that you're bringing into this session before I get rolling with my slides? Emily, go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um... So I guess my biggest question is how do we, in the, in the midst of a CCP meeting, how do we collect quorum and make it final so that the next meeting, when we stick to another subject or topic, the community doesn't come back and say, well, I wasn't here and I'd like to say this or that or the other thing and change whatever work was done in the past meetings. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can talk about that a bit, um, although you might be surprised by my response. So how do you know when you can like consider something kind of done and move on when you're doing community engagement? Can, we, can you consider a discussion closed? Okay, I can try and speak to that a bit. Thanks for the question, Emily. Anybody else have any questions you're bringing into the session before I dive in? Okay. Um, and feel free, of course, as we go through to share your questions uh, in the Zoom chat or jump in at any point. Um, we're a bit of a bigger group. There's 20 of us here in the Zoom room, um, but I think that still there's lots of scope to have this be a back and forth discussion. So um, I'm going to skip my introduction, but I'm going to start by talking about capturing in-person engagements hoping maybe some of our communities are still doing in person uh, and then hoping that we get back to that at some point, even if it does look a little different than it used to. And then I'm also going to be talking about capturing virtual engagement. So recognizing that's how most of us are doing it right now for CCPs. How do we keep really good notes um, from both types of engagement? This is me. Um, so in-person engagement, I'm going to start off by talking about um, flip charting. So I think, Catherine, this ties in with your question. One of my favorite things to do if I'm leading a community session is to have flip chart paper at the front of the room uh, where I, as a facilitator, can write down what I'm hearing people say when we get into discussion, even if there's someone else note taking. And ideally, you do have someone else in the room who's taking like minutes or taking more detailed notes, but I think you should still take some notes at the front of the room. And here's why. 
when you write notes on flip paper, flip chart paper at the front of the room, everyone can see what you're writing down. And so particularly if I'm writing down, if we're doing a brainstorm session, let's say, and I'm asking people to share their ideas on child and family well-being, I'm writing down their ideas and maybe paraphrasing a tiny bit. But if my paraphrasing goes off, or I'm capturing something differently than how they want it to be captured, they can correct me in the moment. Um, and, and then the note takers can adjust their notes as well. And sometimes it happens that people say things differently than how they mean them. And when they see it written down, they go, oh no, that's not quite what I meant. You need to add this piece here. Uh, so that's a really nice way in the moment to do that back and forth um, and digging in. And uh, also, for people who are more visual thinkers, if you're using different colors uh, and using big writing, like few words on, on pieces of paper, um, it, it can be really nice for people to see images of the flip charts later and remember the conversation that was held then, um, especially maybe for folks with different literacy levels, seeing a whole long complicated set of minutes might feel overwhelming. But seeing a picture of one page of flip chart paper with the pink underline uh, and their name beside it, sometimes that can like trigger a memory of a conversation. So I really like to keep photographs then of all the flip charts along with the minutes and, and offer both or keep records of both. Um, I guess I didn't really start with a, a discussion about why capturing in-person or virtual engagement is really critical, but I'm hoping that uh, you know, we're a day and a half into the workshop now, and many of you are months or years into your comprehensive community planning processes, and hopefully you're already experiencing that, you know, community engagement is critical to comprehensive community planning. We have to engage the community and get their voices in order to make these plans come together. But when you're in the moment and you're facilitating and conversations go here, there, everywhere, or you're doing complicated activities, it can be kind of tricky to capture what's being said, uh, especially if there's small groups or different things. So, so that's why we're talking about this stuff. It's different ways we can keep um, bringing that conversation, those conversations that are being had, make sure people see their voices in the final plan. So flip charting, super basic skill. There's actually like a whole um, many resources around good flip charting, but at the end of the day, it's just practice. So uh, I would recommend every CCP planner get a pad of cheap flip chart paper, not that fancy post-it stuff, and a set of Mr. Sketch scented markers, and just practice writing on flip chart paper so you can like confidently do it when you're at the front of a room. Other ways to capture in-person engagement. Um, some people choose to record community engagement sessions, uh, especially if you don't have someone who can take notes or minutes so that you could go back to the recording after the fact and pull notes from that. Um, sometimes we do video recording of sessions or audio only. Maybe we have a really good audio recorder and we put it in the middle of the room or maybe some lavalier mics on people if we have just a couple of speakers. So that is an option. And if you do want to record meetings, uh, it's really crucial to set up and test equipment ahead of time. Every room has its own acoustics and light and all these techie things. And so uh, uh, disaster awaits if you try and get all that stuff happening in the moments before a meeting begins. Hey, Jesse. Um, yeah. Sorry, it's Mariah here. Hey, Mariah. Um, um, just in terms of your recording, is there like a little cheat sheet of equipment? Like, you know, there's a lot of so many different standards and qualities out there. If there's like a standard affordable, um, I guess, just recommendations that you have sure. used. Um, yeah, I can share that. I know. So my husband's a filmmaker, right? Jermaine's a, a videographer. And so um, based on his experience and also my own as a linguist, where we talked about audio equipment, there's the, the little Zoom audio recorders are kind of the standard, uh, you know, beyond just like a cell phone or a real basic microphone. So a Zoom recorder, I think they're a few hundred bucks. They're not super cheap, but I think often language revite programs have them if you need to borrow one for a meeting. And they just allow you to set audio um, gain input levels, that kind of thing. So you can get uh, better audio 
you have more controls to get better audio and then save save digital version so zoom recorder i'll try and find a link or share one in slack later on to what i'm talking about um ideally if you have a couple key people who are going to be speaking you get like a little lavalier mic you know where they have their own sort of pocket pack and their own little microphone to get their audio really crisp and then one for the room i will say that trying to get good audio from a big room full of people is really tricky so uh again like testing it ahead of time with with people spread out the way they might be um, is helpful, but also knowing that you probably won't get every word, especially for those folks that are real quiet in community or, or whatever. Um, in terms of video, like honestly, cell phones have so much capability now that if you get a good uh, tripod or something to hold like a, a cell phone to capture 1080 um, footage, you can even do like the panoramic, view sometimes you know where you get a wide view a wide angle view of the room so don't overlook cell phones but but there's so many um, cameras out there some cameras are better at low light so if you know like the space where you meet has really low light you might want to think about um, looking specifically for camera with low light or if you do a lot of on the land stuff some cameras are a little more water dust resistance so thinking about where you might want to record and getting a camera um, with the appropriate capabilities. Now I do want to say audio and video recording meetings can make people feel really on edge. So I think for a lot of community members, if they uh, are being recorded, they automatically, it, it feels like an interrogation or feels like they're in trouble or like they don't want to say the wrong thing. And so um, I don't tend to audio or video record in-person meetings, unless it's like something, you know, there's the knowledge holder that's gonna be speaking and they they want their words captured to share with the community leader, something like that. So, um, and, and we really need to think about consent if we're gonna be audio video recording, letting people know well ahead of time that that's gonna happen. And also um, being willing to pause recording uh, if folks don't want their voice or their image captured, but they still want to take part in the meeting. So lots of considerations with recording. I think if you can just have a note taker in the room to capture notes instead of recording, it's it's much better, honestly, um, than, than doing audio or video, unless, like I say, there's a special component you want to capture and share afterwards. Um, Another way to capture people's voices when we're doing engagement is to have them write out their own thoughts using a worksheet or using a questionnaire. And so one of my favorite things to do with CCP meetings is to have a short and sweet, like one or two page questionnaire with the big questions that I'm planning to use for dialogue in the session. So let's say I'm having a meeting about housing and I wanna ask people, you know, um, what is your vision for housing in the community? Or if you had a magic wand, what would you change about our on-reserve housing? Or what do you think um, would help off-reserve members find better housing? Just real basic questions like that. You pick like, you know, up to 10 of them, put them on a short questionnaire with lots of space for people to write their answers, always space at the end for general comments. I like to make them anonymous so people can share without you know share freely without putting their name on it um and so a few things that are great about doing a, a paper questionnaire for in-person gatherings you uh can fill gaps in the meeting so in my community we might say the meeting starts at five but really it's going to start at 5 30 because two-thirds of the people are going to roll in late but you know, Granny Mary is going to be there right at five, ready to rock and roll. And it's always kind of a bummer waiting around for everyone else to show up. So if you have questionnaires or worksheets, it's really nice too to go to Granny Mary and say, thank you so much for coming to the meeting. Um, we're really glad you're here. We're talking about housing today. And here's a questionnaire. So we'd love for you to share your thoughts. Um, if you have someone who can sit with Granny Mary and help her fill in the questionnaire. That's really nice too, to make it more inclusive, but then you fill that time and she doesn't feel like she's just waiting around for everyone else to show up. The other thing I love about questionnaires is that people will share their like unbridled opinions about things in the questionnaire that they won't share in person in a conversation. So in a questionnaire, you'll get comments like, uh, I don't know, the, the trickier things to say, like, 
uh, housing on reserve is, is uh, we have lots of opportunities to get housing. It's just that people don't take care of their houses. People might say that in a questionnaire. They would never say that in a conversation because that would hurt feelings, um, which is so. So basically, you get the other side of the conversation through people's written anonymous comments while having a community conversation that's also valuable in its own way and bringing those two sources of information together really rounds out your sense of what's going on in community and how to move forward in a good way. Um, so short and sweet uh, questionnaires and you can also have an online version so people that miss your in-person meetings can just fill out the questionnaire and still have their thoughts included uh, and you could do prize draw around that or whatever. Maybe you do multiple choice questions to get some like numbers like 80% of the community thinks we should uh, build um, multiplexes on reserve or only 15% of people who took this questionnaire think we should build apartments on reserve or whatever, whatever it might be. I'm focusing on housing, but you could use it on any topic. Um, I just have one or two more slides for in-person engagement and then I'll pause before we go to virtual. Another option that can be done for uh, in-person or virtual engagement is graphic recording. So there are incredible graphic recorders out there and actually like a good handful of Indigenous graphic recorders who do these beautiful graphic representations of conversations during meetings, uh, although they can also create graphics uh, before a meeting to, to bring a bunch of information together or afterwards watching a recording. You know, we have um, Michelle Buchholz from CassieX, uh, Tiara Young and other Indigenous folks in BC who we see doing graphic recording at many different sessions. So it's a bit of an extra cost. I think it tends to cost between, you know, one and three thousand dollars for a meeting, depending on if it's a half day, full day. But so worth it, I think, if you have the budget and community members tend to really love the visual record of a meeting, it can be more accessible for folks with different literacy levels than just a set of minutes. And uh, just also allow our creative, visual, holistic systems brains to see pieces come together in a different way than when we're just recording like a record of decisions. Um, Two more slides on in-person engagement. So again, obviously you could have a note taker in the session. Um, if it's a really long meeting, you probably wanna have a couple different folks taking notes so they can spell each other off. Uh, but when it comes to taking notes or minutes from a meeting, you there's a broad range of options. So some folks uh, like verbatim notes where it's like every person's name who speaks and like almost all their comments. Uh, verbatim, word for word, that's what that means. Uh, and some people keep more like record of decision minutes where they're not capturing the whole conversation, just the big decisions that are made or the, you know, the big suggestions that come out of a whole bunch of uh, conversation. I would say for CCP meetings, I tend to like verbatim notes because Sometimes it takes community members a while to get to the recommendation, but all the preamble is really important. And so having verbatim notes allows me to go back into the conversation and remember who said what um, later on that might have been missed in just like the, the record of decision. So fast typers, you need fast typers to take good detailed minutes like that. And, um, and also recognize that if you're doing breakout groups or complicated activities that might, you might need multiple note takers for the different sessions or special worksheets or something like that to bring it all together. Um, and also you need to budget time after meetings for note takers to go clean up their notes, add the pieces that got missed, maybe add in screenshots of your, uh, or photographs of your flip chart paper and just pull it all together. So it takes time to do good minutes for meetings. Um, but it's worth it. Don't leave it all to the end when it's like months past the meeting and you can't remember what happened in that session. Um, last slide for in-person engagement. So in addition to the uh, questionnaire for people to write their own thoughts, we can do lots of creative activities using post-its where people can write out thoughts on post-it notes and put them on posters or clump them with other people's comments that are similar. Um, or we can do creative activities like story harvest or dot democracy or interactive posters. 
So story harvest is where you have designated storytellers in a big group who share stories on like, again, let's just go with housing, people who share stories about how housing used to be in our communities back in the day. And then you've designated listeners listening to the story, trying to pull ideas from it. So maybe you make a worksheet for the listeners to track their notes or draw pictures that come to them. And that's how you capture that storytelling engagement. For democracy, Maybe you have like 20 different ideas for housing and you wanna prioritize from those 20 ideas and figure out what are the top four that the community really supports. So maybe you put each idea on its own poster and you have 20 posters around the room. Everyone gets four sticky dots and they get to go vote with their dots for the four ideas they most support out of the 20 and maybe space for them to write their notes on the posters too and so Catherine again you know your question about these more sort of visual um, ways of getting feedback but also ways of testing ideas with the community and having that back and forth I think democracy is really helpful for that so you might have a dialogue where you get a bunch of ideas and, and you capture those in minutes. And then in the next meeting, you have these democracy posters where you ask people to vote for priorities. So you're bringing it back a few times before it goes into the final plan. And then find the interactive posters. I mean, man, you can make posters on all kinds of things. We did one in my community to choose the color we're gonna paint the hall. We put four options. I did mock-ups of like blue, red, orange, purple. And we invited people to come into the band office and vote for the color they liked the best. And we did it online as well. And that's how we decided to paint the hall, you know, red. Um, so lots of different ways to use interactive posters for in-person engagement, um, even like outside of meetings, like just in the band office or public space. Um, I wanna answer Emily's question and then pause and see if folks have other ideas for in-person engagement. Uh, so Emily, you asked about, you know, what happens if you have a big discussion about what you want to see happen in housing and you kind of wrap up that discussion and the next meeting is about health, but someone comes into your health meeting and says, I missed the housing meeting and uh, I don't agree that we should build housing for families. I think we should focus on the elders. Like, how do you deal with that kind of situation? So I would say, I'm going to pause here for a moment and say, one of the most powerful things about comprehensive community planning is that it empowers our community members to have a say in the future of our community. And so many of our community members feel left out of decision making. And so much of the conflict in our communities comes because people feel left out of decision making feel like they don't have a family member on council, or they don't have a friend in the band office, and they don't have any power to influence what happens. And so it is crucial in the CCP through good community engagement and good inclusive conversation that we reassure community members that through this plan, they do have a say in what happens in the community. This is a powerful tool. And if we do that properly, we prevent so, or we deal, we heal so much conflict in community by giving power making people see their own power and making sure they have share their voice in the CCP. So when we do something like rely on quorum and say, okay, we have this many people, now we can make a decision. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of quorum for CCP meetings um, because I think if two people show up to your meeting on health or housing or lands, those two people should be able to put their ideas out there. And if you have 50 people show up, those 50 people should be able to put their ideas out there. And you as the coordinators just facilitate that conversation, no matter how many or how few people show up. Uh, and so something like quorum can delegitimize conversations based on the number of people present, which can feel, um, can be tricky. And the other thing is there's lots of reasons why people might miss a meeting that are outside of their control. And so uh, if someone came to my health meeting and they wanted to talk about housing, first of all, I would make sure to say, I'm so glad you want to share your ideas on housing. Uh, you know, we did have that meeting last week, but I still want your ideas. Um, however, today, you know, we're here to focus on health and I want to make sure we have time to do that. So if you want to come to me and talk one on one about your ideas for housing, let's set that up. Or if you want a copy of the housing questionnaire, 
to fill out while we're talking about health. Let's do that. Um, or if we need to have another meeting on housing because a bunch of people weren't there because there was a community event happening, let's just plan another meeting on housing. So I think as long as people continue to come back to you with new ideas that for the CCP that haven't been mentioned already, you should be trying to weave their ideas in rather than saying we've already covered that topic and we're, we're moving on now. Up till the very moment the CCP is finalized, there should be space to weave people's voices in and make sure the CCP reflects everyone's vision. The way we do that partially is by making sure that the goals and objectives in the CCP are not so specific that they feel like they're leaving out things that are important to people. Um, and so there's a reason the goals in the CCP are kind of high level and vague so that they can as much as possible encompass what everyone wants to see without adding detail that might exclude certain possibilities. Um, okay, so I've been talking for a long time now. I'm gonna pause there and uh, invite either Catherine or Emily to build on the thoughts I've shared or anyone else in this group to share your own thoughts about how to capture in-person engagement well. You can share it in Zoom chat and I'll read it out loud or just unmute yourself and, and jump into the conversation. I can jump in if you want. It's, it's more to, to build on what you were just saying. So maybe for Emily, but I mean, for, I'm saying it for myself as well. Um, I mean, it's interesting because CCP, the way I look at it is both, yeah, the, the result of it, the actual plan, whatever it looks like, whether it's a video or whatever, but it's also the actual journey that, that you're on. And in a way, it, <laughs> It, it never really begins and it never really ends, which is interesting. And so, so yes, there are decisions that are being made, but there's also decisions on how decisions are made that are gonna can keep changing your process. So I, I love what you said about weaving it in all the time because it, it is what it is. And, and you will have to do that even once your document is made, like things will keep changing and you'll start implementing it before your document is finished anyway, or your video is finished, whatever it looks like. So. Um, I think we should probably not look at it as a project that needs to be finished at some point. It's, it's something that's ongoing. It's, it's how do we come back to ourselves and start from there to move out and just keep all the initiatives in that need to be in and hear all the voices we need to do. Thank you for that, Catherine. Yeah, it's making me think about like the classic example of like the Souk CCP, which was a one page table of goals and objectives, right? but they did so much community engagement over three years that the community was like 100% behind those goals and objectives and they made it happen. And so, as you say, like the process is more important for CCP than the plan at the end. Um, yeah, the measure of success is if people feel included uh, in the process. Um, I'm also thinking like Emily and Mariah, like anytime we put restrictions on people, or not any time, but for a lot of our community members, any time we put restrictions on them, they're going to push back against that because it feels like, you know, Indian affairs, like telling us what to do and how to do things. So I notice this, like if I'm facilitating a meeting, if I have time limits, if it's like, okay, everyone has three minutes to share their comment. The moment I mention time limits, certain people are going to go on forever because they just are pushing back against the idea of time limits, right? Whereas if I don't mention time limits and maybe I let one or two people go on a little bit and then say just gently, you know, like, thank you so much. We've got 10 other people on the speaker speakers list. So if we wanna hear from everyone, we're gonna to have to take about three or four minutes max. If I do it that gentle way, where there's a reason for the time limit to give everyone time to speak, everyone gets it and it goes way smoother. Okay. And, uh, I get asked to chair like treaty AGMs and different things all the time. And lots of times there's these really tight rules and like Robert's rules of order and stuff. And my experience is that in community, the more rules, the more like unruly people get and the more you're just kind of respectful uh, and, and using common sense instead of falling back on the rules, the more people feel heard. Um, and sometimes, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. 
like one example would be we had a vote right on a certain way of where we're labeling or what's informal um community names versus informal what's on swag versus marketing um and then we went around every home had meetings about it multiple meetings and had a vote and a say from every household in the community and everyone bought in and we were transparent with the results and we moved in that direction but now there's people that 10 months later are recanting on that and i'm like whoa whoa we had like a full community <laughs> view input like everyone was included so it's like it's like uh one it's covid and um, mental capacity of what we used to do what was before covid life is way different than what we thought it was pre-covid and it's like how do we gently remind that like well this was uh, an effective community engagement we did do all those steps where everyone had a voice and flowing with that advancement not always bringing us back but like that's what I mean about like let's move forward now because everyone did have a say and mm. why not circle back and do create more work than we've already done you know what I mean? that kind of a thing I hear you and so I think if it's on something like a name or like a logo or something where it's not going to impact people's well-being it's just kind of a choice uh that allows you to move forward with ordering swag or branding your materials or setting up the Facebook page or whatever, in that case, when you've gone through your process and made your decision, for sure, move on. When people like give you crap later on, you could say, you know, this, these are the steps we took, like I hear you, but we're, you know, now we're into it and it, it's like too late. Yeah. However, I will say that when you're making decisions that impact people's well-being, so let's say you're talking about the CCP goals around health, like if people are coming back to you and saying that they weren't involved, even if it was 10 months ago, you have to listen to them. And I know it's so frustrating. I've been dealing with this for 10 years <laughs> and it's so frustrating when you work as hard as you can to plan community meetings, to get the word out, use Facebook, use the community newsletter. You're working your butt off to have all these great engagements and like a handful of people show up and you try and move forward. And then months into it, a group of people comes back and says, well, I wasn't included. This is all illegitimate. I mean, this is happening to me right now in my own community. So I'm with you. Um, and at the, so I think there's this balance between you need to move forward with your community engagement, even if not everyone is present. And at the same time, when people come back to you later and say, I wasn't included, I mean, they're right. <laughs> and so, so we need to, the best thing we can do, I think is CCP coordinators is create a CCP work plan that's flexible, that allows us to go back in and change things and revisit sections and bring drafts back to the community, you know, that, that builds it step-by-step step along with the community rather than making big leaps where people maybe feel left out. And, um, that's why CCP might take like three years to write the first one instead of like six months like the uh, like other plans, you know, because it just takes time to to do that outreach. And um, I think we also need to recognize that some folks might have uh, invisible disabilities that prevent them from taking part in engagements or people might go through a tough time with their family or whatever that prevents them from taking part in meetings for a few months. And so, um, so it's tricky when you've worked really hard and you're like onto the next step, but, but finding gentle ways to include them, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one phone call, like, okay, you're all disgruntled because you didn't take part. Let's have a one-on-one -on -one call or a family meeting. You can say whatever you want about what you wish was happening in this community. We'll be there. We'll buy you dinner. We'll take notes and make sure your voice is included. We've done that a lot in CCPs as well. I have a question. How has your engagements changed since Kamloops? It's like, oh my goodness. Community capital infrastructure where we had somewhat of a plan, a fast six month plan, short term plan that was going to be groundbreaking, literally. But now it's like, I guess, instilling and holding that faith that we're still on the goals, but nationally, things have changed for the search. And and because Wheatlalai is on a gray area, whether it's numb use or not, like that community engagement is beyond just uh, our community now. 
Yeah, I love this question. I mean, there was a session earlier, I think, about trauma-informed planning. So my experience with Guasanacuara CCP is that after the news of Kamloops and everywhere else about the, the graves, we just, we took a break from community engagement. We said, we know people are hurting right now. Um, and so in some cases, maybe we did engagement that was more social, just like come together and just share how you're feeling. But but we took, put a pause on the working, like, you know, what are your ideas in housing or anything unrelated to that trauma that people were going through. Um, and actually, because it also impacted the mental health of the CCP coordinators, uh, myself included, we really slowed down engagement over the summer just in general. So we were planning to do CCP meetings all summer long and we ended up just the spin-off effects of big trauma like that caused everything to slow down. So um, now we're back at it with our community meetings uh, but it's just happening slowly, <laughs> you know, we get fewer people because people are still grieving. And so we pushed our whole timeline from trying to finish by December to finishing in March to give ourselves those extra few months to continue on with the engagement. Um, and I, I think if you're finding your CCP process slowing down because people just needed to take a break or you needed to take a break, it could never hurt to go back to the funder like ISK or whoever else and say, look, we need another six months to a year to finish this process because we just had to slow down engagement or we need a little bit more money to do things because we weren't able to cover the, all the ground because um, we were dealing with the trauma. And uh, in my experience, they've been pretty flexible with giving that extra time. Um, it's also, you know, I think just a reminder of why we always need to be trauma informed in our engagement. We always need to recognize that people are coming into meetings uh, with grief on their hearts, whether it's from personal losses or huge national stories that bring up personal situations or they're in it in the moment, right? So being really gentle and kind with people, letting them participate or not participate, like right here in this meeting, you know, look how many folks have video off and are not sharing voices or questions. And that's okay. Maybe for some folks, it just feels really nice to just sit back and listen and sort of be taken care of. Whereas for other people, they want to have their voice in there. So just giving people space to do what they need to do and being trauma informed and researching what it means to be trauma informed so we can hold space in that way. Um, and I guess one other thing, like Emily and Mariah, I mean, I was just up in Yalise a couple of weeks ago for Orange Shirt Day when there was the big community celebration and, and uplifting survivors and gathering in the big house in the Gutsi to celebrate our resilience. And so that's part of CCP too, right? These like spontaneous community events that happen to bring people together and share our stories and talk about what we wanna see happening in the future, that's community planning, even if we didn't plan it. And so for you to be there, for you to be supporting that, absorbing those stories, those voices, and, and don't be afraid to bring that into the CCP document as like part of the work that was done this year. Um, maybe that's how people wanna be engaging that in Zoom talking about housing policy. That's okay. Any yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, that naturally brought up things, and even us bugging Jermaine to join us for the video. <laughs> we were like, "Hey," because people just the environment alone brought out engagement. It brought out natural stories just through hearing a fire versus just hearing the singing. You know what I mean? Because it's been two years without that space being utilized. So, yeah, that was a really cool event. <laughs> And we were all about events. And so COVID really threw our community engagement on a kind of a strap. And now we're kind of rebels because we're trying to redefine what is essential now, today, after two years. And even on the crisis of our youth and mental health and substance abuse. And um, so it's really, it's bringing out a different lens, but it's just uh, overall a community engagement because it's even our youth like young seven-year-olds are telling us what they want now because my daughter who's seven is impacted by Kamloops by asking us like, well, did you go to that school mom? You know, and so like, uh, as well as it's been a really scary thing across Canada and triggering for many people, it's also really inspired youth to have more of a voice because 
they weren't aware, but now they are definitely aware by seeing all these symbolic monuments around everywhere, even red dresses and creating conversations for really young kids. So mm. thanks, Jess. I don't want to take up too much. But <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> nice to hear your voices. And yeah, that's, those are beautiful examples. It's making me, yeah, just think about how like you stepping up to take care of the older folks in the community that went through residential schools, right? Like that's a beautiful thing to see too, where more folks are aware of what folks in their family went through that they didn't know before the stories that were shared that hadn't been shared before. And I think that inspired, like you say, even little kids to step in and go, oh, this is, that's why that's happened in community. And that's why we need to be different, do things differently in the future. Um, I think also a really good example of when video recording is helpful. So that the event, the Orange Shirt Day event and raising the art piece in the community, you know, it's land-based. It was a huge group of people. You had speakers there like Bobby Joe and others, other survivors, you know, sharing their stories. There were the dances and then the part in the Gutsi. So all those things are perfect for video when you want that visual reminder of the power of the day um, and the words that those speakers shared that they wanted to be shared publicly. So um, yeah, that place-based stuff, especially it's really nice to get that on video if you can. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm surprised to see you, but I'm so glad you were here. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was weeping in the big house because I was there with my daughter and it's the first time we've been in the big house in two years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, in, there's something about in-person engagement, just like sharing that space, sharing our voices, especially in our, our sacred spaces. It's like so powerful and maybe don't capture all those little moments, but it impacts people and they carry it forward with them as a real gift to be there. Mm -hmm. Medicine. <laughs> totally. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> I'm going to cover these last couple of slides about uh, virtual engagement. Um, recognizing we've got about 15 minutes left in the session. So again, if you've got additional thoughts to share, uh, feel free to paste them in Zoom chat and Catherine, Emily, and Mariah are happy to keep um, chatting too. So when we're doing virtual engagement, there's a few different ways to capture that as well. Um, you can still have note takers. I like to have like a Google Doc open and having multiple people adding notes from the session um, on the side of my screen. Um, but you can also record, of course, Zoom has the built-in recording function. Um, I love now that it gives everyone a notification before it starts recording, because again, consent is just so crucial. And for really good reason, some people might not want their images um, captured on video. I mean, some people have had experiences with stalkers uh, or with the legal system or child apprehension or different things where they have really legit reasons for not wanting their image or their voices captured in video that will be shared publicly, uh, as well as maybe other issues around like body dysmorphia or whatever. So we need to really respect when people don't want their image or their voice captured on video, even if we don't know what those reasons are. So we need to get consent before recording and also be willing to pause if people do want to jump in and share, but not on video. And then you also need a plan for storing and sharing files. So I have like a kajillion Zoom recordings on my computer. And for some reason, I never have enough time to like either A, put the video up on YouTube and share the link in my community's Facebook page, or B, like send the video file to someone that that is that wants it, that can distribute it like that. So uh, just budgeting time and making a plan for what you're going to do with the video recordings after you record them, because they can't stay on Zoom for forever. Uh, if you get too many, it starts deleting them. So you need a plan for the data. And how long, you know, is it going to be publicly viewable or password protected or, or um, what are you going to do there? So you can record it. You can also set up closed captions in Zoom meetings. It's super cool where it automatically makes little captions based on what people are saying. They're not perfect, but they're pretty good. And when you enable that, it creates a transcript. Um, it's almost like minutes from your verbatim notes from your, your meeting if you enable transcripts. So that's super cool and a good way to make it more accessible for folks um, with hearing or other disabilities who rely on captions. You can also Facebook live stream. 
Um, if you're going to do that, please make sure you test it ahead of time. We ran into troubles with the CCP meeting this summer where Zoom did an update that changed the way that Facebook live streaming worked. And we didn't test it ahead of time because we'd been doing them and it was going fine. So we got to the day of our CCP meeting that we're going to do in Zoom and live stream on Facebook. And we couldn't get it to work. We couldn't figure it out in that moment. And so we actually had to postpone that whole meeting because we get half our members uh, taking part on live stream. So um, if you do live stream, of course, it saves the video on the Facebook timeline. So that's a nice way also to make sure that people that aren't there can watch it after the fact and see the comments and all that stuff. Uh, if you are going to live stream a Zoom meeting, you want to have a facilitator or helper who's just managing that, taking care of that, making sure it's running smoothly, and also watching for comments in Facebook and bringing them into Zoom chat so the facilitator can read them out loud and make sure they get captured on video, um, as well as reading out loud comments in the Zoom chat, because we know that these comments can disappear. So what you read on video is what gets captured, um, unless you've got the, the minutes. Uh, you can also use virtual whiteboard tools. We really like Miro or Miro um, as one option. And here's just like a little screenshot of it. It's basically like flip charting, but virtual. Uh, you can do mind mapping. You can do dot democracy. You can set up voting. You can do breakout groups where each group has their own little section of the whiteboard to do their own little activity. It's got lots of potential. Too much for me to go into right now, but there's great virtual whiteboard tools. Um, you can also just use it as a display, as a facilitator where you write the post-its and um, write the notes, however you want to use it. You can do virtual questionnaires or polls. Zoom has some options, but you can also use Mentimeter or Qualtrics or other tools for doing little questionnaires in the meeting um, or sharing them on Facebook. And again, you want to test it ahead of time um, to make sure they work. Uh, and if you're doing polls in Zoom, you want to make sure you like screenshot the results because you lose the results when you when you move on in the meeting and that can be that can suck. That's the end of my suggestions for capturing virtual recording um, or virtual community engagement. Um, we've got 10 minutes left in the session. So again, does anyone else have any experiences uh, capturing virtual engagement that you'd love to share? Um, or questions about how to make sure we keep good records of the conversations we're having in community so that we can write a really good plan. Yeah, so I have like, in terms of virtual, um, how did you, I know some communities elders laptops were purchased or I just felt like resources wise trying to even go to every elder's homes to make sure they were troubleshooted or they were engaged or I know that was a part of yeah. ours but we're like I don't have the manpower to go to every elder's homes to make sure they were tapped in right yeah that's just it we did the same thing in my community where we had uh we had we offered one-on-one -on -one tech support for anyone that needed like a Zoom tutorial. And we actually did like a Zoom one-on-one -on -one workshop for the community before we did started the Zoom engagement. And no one took advantage of it with money set aside to buy tablets and, and data cards and stuff. And no one um, followed up and asked for that support. So I think it does come down to if you have someone like an elders coordinator that could reach out one-on-one -on -one to elders and say, what would it take for you to be able to take part in these meetings or gatherings or what would make you feel engaged and following up on a kind of one on one basis, which we can do in smaller communities. Um, another thing that can be done, I think, is incentivizing youth or others to help elders get connected. So uh, we're not doing this right now, but for our CCP, but for other projects like giving special honoraria for youth who like bring their tablet or laptop over to granny's house and get on the Zoom meeting together uh, and compensating both of them for the extra work required to do that. I mean, lots of times we have elders honoraria for meetings, but youth honoraria too, or helper honoraria for people that get them online. I think that could help a lot. 
Um, but also, I mean, with any engagement, just recognizing that you're not ever going to be able to create an engagement that works for everyone for various reasons. And so this is why we need to do the widest variety possible of engagement, Zoom meetings, Facebook live stream, one-on-one -on -one phone calls, uh, online questionnaires, paper surveys that go house to house, mail outs that go house to house, posters in the band office, posters on telephone poles around the community, presentations in the school, presentations in staff meetings, in chief and council meetings, chatting to people out on the street, going to uh, sports tournaments with questionnaires to hand them out, uh, paying for dinner for people to bring their own families together and meet with the coordinators. Like just there's no one of those things that's going to work for everyone. So you do as many as you possibly can uh, and just budget your money and time and resources accordingly. Knowing that community engagement is the heart of the CCP and um, the, the long-term benefits of doing a good job of it are worth the extra time and effort to do a phenomenal job in these couple years when you are doing the first one. Anybody else with your own stories about capturing engagement effectively or questions? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit for a moment. Oh, it's, yeah, Catherine, go ahead. I was just waiting to see if anyone else. Did. So I guess I have a question, and it's you said something at the beginning that that I love um, many things, obviously, but you said something around seeing voices, and it's something that that I've seen often that some people are just not comfortable expressing them, themselves like through words for some reason, but they would be great at helping out or like showing that something is important to them through action rather than through words or writing or drawing or whatever. So I'm, I'm curious if you've got like experience with kinds of engagement that are more about like action than about words. And, it, and maybe you don't, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one example that's coming to mind right away is around land use planning. So community mapping activities where people draw areas on a map that they love in the community or parts where they don't feel safe or put, you know, stickies on maps with ideas for things that could happen there. That can be really cool. And we actually did a land use planning workshop in my community where we made little, um, we made giant maps from like Google Earth of the reserve. And then we made little models, um, 3D models of different things we could build that were to scale. So we found examples of sixplexes or shopping malls or docks or sawmills or the PNE <laughs> or whatever, all these different things people wanted, had talked about wanting to see in the community. And we printed them out to scale and put them on foam core. So they were like 3D. And then we had small groups where people could like basically build the community they wanted to see. We had like four stations with a whole kit of these 3D uh, land uses and these big base maps. And so working in small groups, people could build out the community they wanted to see. And then we, we took video of each group at the end of the activity, walking through their little like visionary community. Um, so that was super cool. No one had to write anything. It wasn't word based. People just had to show like what they wanted. Um, I mean, there are other embodied activities. I'm thinking about soft shoe shuffle, like a conversation on your feet where people uh, you're all standing around in a big room and someone says something that they want to see happening in the community. And if you agree with them, we move closer. If you disagree you move farther away, then you have someone else to share. And if people agree with them, they move closer or move farther away if they disagree. I mean, it takes some training to do that stuff well. And like physical consent is a big part too, making sure people feel safe. But there's some, some really fun, maybe some terms for people to look up are like somatic uh, facilitation or embodied facilitation. Uh, and you will get examples of activities that, that use our bodies rather than our, our words so much. Um, Emily and Mariah, go ahead. Um, I can't remember where, I think it was the first CCP I went to in Harrison, where there was an action-based one where a community bought Monopoly money and everyone got a budget and they had all these fishbowls of where would you spend your money? And that was a really unique way of getting input. 
is yeah. like prioritizing how they wanted the money in community to be spent. So that was one of the things that I thought of. That's a great example. I think that was Skidigit. And it was like, yes, we've got like 10 ideas for giant construction projects on the community. If you had a million dollars in fake money, how would you invest it in these projects? Uh, it's like a, a different, um, like a prioritization option besides democracy, a little more um, playful. Thank you for that example. I think a lot of the prioritization exercises where you're voting with sticky dots, using play money, uh, you know, um, adding post-its to the options you really like, the prioritization exercises give a lot of room for people to share how they feel without having to use words so much. It can be handy that way. Mm -hmm. I think often something people struggle with is like why, why, what they're trying to capture. So I want to talk about that for a quick moment before we wrap up the panel. So remember that the purpose of most of the community engagement in the CCP is to figure out what the community's goals, uh, like vision, goals, and objectives are in all the different parts of the community, however you label them. And so for me, when I'm doing community engagement, what I'm listening for are any suggestions about what we should do in the future, any ideas about what we should do in the future, any complaints about things that are happening now that could be turned around into an idea of how to do them differently. It's like any of those suggestions about what the community should look like in the future, that's specifically what I'm listening for. Not so much the discussion about what, what's going on now, and it's about the future. And so for myself, when I'm taking CCP notes, sometimes I bold ideas that people throw out so I can come back to them really easily later. And then you're also listening for the scale of the ideas that people are sharing. So maybe someone shares, uh, you know, this one particular elder needs more support from health and family services because they're, they're not getting good at home care. That's a really specific suggestion. Maybe you turn that into an objective that's like uh, outreach to elders on a weekly basis to make sure they're getting taken care of. But maybe you hear like 20 comments kind of like that, that are similar. And then you go, oh, okay, maybe this is a goal about making sure we're taking elders, uh, taking care of elders in a, in a better way. It's not just about home care. It's not just about this one elder. It's about, in general, this is a big problem in the community that we need to address. And then it becomes like a big goal instead of a smaller, more specific objective. So, so in, again, final note, just in capturing engagement, always be listening for those ideas of what to do in the future and thinking about whether it's like a big high level goal kind of thing or real specific like objective or action. Um, thank you so much for being in the session, Catherine, Emily, and Mariah. Thanks so much for being like co-panelists. And for everyone else who's been in here to listen and witness or maybe share comments and chat, uh, really grateful to have you here. See you in plenary. <laughs>